we do have one. Yes. Okay, that was my gavel right there. Um, it is uh, 4.05 on August the 16th. This is the City of Tallahassee Independent Ethics Board. Um, we have a quorum. I would note that uh, we have one member, Mr. Ojtaya, who will be a few minutes late, one member, uh, Ms. Phillips, who is, has an excused absence, and uh, one audience member, Mr. Poitavent, who is also excused with our best wishes. Um, first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from July the 19th, our last meeting. Does anyone have any comments, corrections, or a motion to approve them? I move the uh, minutes for the last meeting be approved. Mr. Friedman moves the minutes. Take it. And Mr. Davis seconds them. All in favor, aye. Opposed, like sign, and the minutes are approved. The next item on the agenda, if I didn't bury my agenda under paper, uh, would be the ethics officer report, Ms. Meadows Keefe. Good afternoon, board members. Um, you have in front of you, um, as usual, the um, ethics officer report that um, contains the activities um, from the last time that we met carrying forward. Um, I have continued to attend um, the various campaign um, events in Tallahassee as I can um, to not only promote the campaign contribution refund program, but also to promote the visibility of this board. Um, in the community. Um, additionally, the this was interesting, this didn't make it onto my report, but the director of my daughter's school, she goes to Florida State University School, um, wanted me to come and talk to all the teachers about um, how we act and behave ethically within organizations and what my experience was like being the first ethics officer at the city of Tallahassee. So the chair had asked me a few meetings ago, um, how youth view it, and I think I had made some comment about how it's starting to pervade every aspect of life. And um, now we're talking about it um, with teachers and educators and um, how we conduct our business in, in ethical ways. So, so basically, Ms. Meadows Keefe, now when your kid says it's not fair, they're actually making an ethics complaint. <laughs> well, as I explained to my daughter, um, the assembly was with all faculty and staff at her school. They now know um, who her mom is, so she has no chance at all of getting away with anything. Um, on the um, tracking sheet, um, you will note the calls received um, in the last month. Um, and the resolution of those calls, the budget report, and the report on the campaign contribution um, refunds, re uh, re requests received to date, and um, I believe checks were cut to um, the first round of people um, at the end of July. So if your check hasn't come yet, I will say the check's in the mail. Did it come? I'm seeing a nod of affirmation. Um, so oh this is a momentous occasion. Um, and I think so far the tally is um, 18 received. So um, as was pointed out by um, an astute member of the community, um, this particular election cycle perhaps was not the best test case for the contribution program because we have now two incumbent commissioners. Um, I guess the best case study for this would be wide open commission races with no incumbents running. I don't know when that will happen. Um, but that kind of messed up the works a little bit. But we continue to get the message out. A uh, question for you, Ms. Meadows Keefe. If, if there were a situation where an incumbent for whatever reason, was unable to serve and we had a special election, um, would the, and I need to go back and read it, does the uh, campaign contribution refund program work in special elections or just regular elections? I'm gonna have to go back and read that, but I'm, I'm guessing that it would apply in any election um, where 
we have people running and where there are contributions received. So if people were able to contribute to the candidate, um, I would argue with our lawyer not here um, that we would read that broadly. Okay. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you'd come back at the next meeting, just to advise us on that, because sooner or later that will happen. Mm -hmm. um, the next item on the agenda is our uh, monthly ethics moment. I actually believe we sort of have two ethics moments here, although they're pretty closely related. Uh, one's a opinion from the uh, State Commission on Ethics that you're going to review, and the other is a uh, uh, <clears throat> awful, I will say, situation that happened in New Jersey. So I try to balance um, the ethics moments with one that's a little more serious and relates to our job here as um, board members and staff on how the Florida Commission on Ethics evaluates questions so they can be dry. Um, I then try to balance it with um, kind of a current news item, and I follow all of these um, rather closely. Um, and actually tweet them out on occasion, which um, is interesting. The first one is um, a Commission on Ethics advisory opinion from June 8th, 2016, um, and it relates to conflicts of interest, misuse of position, and voting conflicts for people that are on um, advisory boards. So we have talked a lot um, hear about the role of advisory board members and that we have many active advisory boards here in the city. I'd also point out that um, this relates to um, something, again, that we've talked about, that the Commission on Ethics receives requests for advisory opinions on conflicts of interests matters more frequently than any other type of matter, and this would make sense because people want to check stuff out before they actually go ahead and do it. So here, um, this person served on a county human services advisory board, so that's a CHSP, and that's actually been in the news lately um, here in town. But this, this is a board that basically after the county commission allocates a chunk of money to go to human services programs, um, this advisory board analyzes the various programs that want money and they make recommendations to the commission on who ought to get what chunk of that money. And here we have a person serving who I guess was an attorney we have an overabundance of attorneys on all of these boards. It seems like they're trying to do some good stuff. But here, this attorney was going to be suing um, a nonprofit. Like one, he was representing one nonprofit, going to sue another nonprofit. So he was asking, um, "Is this going to present a conflict of interest?" for me in my service here, and pretty clearly the Ethics Commission said that um, the answer was yes. Um, so that gentleman's most likely going to have to make a choice unless he goes through the um, waiver process. Um, so whether you know he can work through that and present that to the board and the board votes to basically relieve him of that conflict, um, he's most likely um, not going to be able to continue to do that. Let, let me interrupt. When you say the board can vote to relieve him of the conflict, that's the Board of County Commissioners, yes. not the advisory board. It's not the, the advisory the, board. It's the, the appointing authority. Um, which I, I suspect would be hesitant to relieve anybody of a conflict of interest. Correct. So I think at, at that point he's got a decision to make. And then um, there was another question presented there about um, when they are actually making those funding decisions. Um, he may be prejudiced against one of those organizations, most likely the one that he's suing, um, to, to not want to allocate the funds fairly. So the question is, am I going to be able to be fair um, evaluating these funding requests if I'm suing? Um, so again, the Ethics Commission said that um, he ought to be very careful about that. 
disclose the conflict and may wish not to participate in those types of decisions. Um, and finally, that um, he should not utilize any information he gets through his service on this board to benefit him in his representation of the nonprofit. Because you recall that the ethics code says that um, if you get information from your service here that's not generally available to the public, you can't then turn around and use it to your benefit. So um, I, I think this ethics commission um, opinion was pretty clear. They always try to give the person some wiggle room, but um, this seemed like a pretty solid, you're going to have to make a choice type of advisory opinion. Moving on to the second one, this is more the one for fun, but um, I have relatives in New Jersey. We, we, we have a, they have a nice place in Ocean Grove, but um, this one relates to Passaic Valley, New Jersey, and they have a sewage commission. And I can't imagine the waiting list to serve on that commission. But um, they were doing some things that were inappropriate. Um, and many of them were, actually two of them were sent to prison. And the reason was that they were using the staff um, at the Sewage Commission to do personal repair work at their house. Um, that's generally frowned upon. Um, the, the, the thing that was most outstanding to me is that one of the people involved um, was a former commissioner on the Sewage Commission and the agency's ethics officer. So um, that person was given 90 days in jail and um, they've lost their jobs and it's, it's basically quite disgraceful. So um, the Attorney General of New Jersey said all the men abused their positions, exploited public workers, used vehicles for their own purposes and equipment at the expense of taxpayers, and um, they will be held accountable. So this was just kind of an interesting story in the news of um, criminal charges brought in another Jurisdiction. Right, and to tie that to Florida, I'd point out that if that happened here, not only would you lose your job, you would also lose your retirement, yep. um, which would be pretty awful. Mr. Friedman. Before that end, uh, when I went to college, I worked for the city of Jersey City Sewage Authority. And one day uh, they dumped uh, a driveway load, and the driveway must have been a quarter of a mile long, a roof shingle. And that was a Friday. I came back to work Monday. They were all gone. Two years later, the mayor of Jersey City went to prison. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, but there it included the materials also. They don't learn quick in Jersey. I know I'm from there. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ochtayo, I believe oh, you had. No, no, sorry. Let you had your hand up. No? No? Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is uh, Ms. Ferris, who's the Director of Communications for the city, who's going to tell us all about how the city of Tallahassee communicates. And as Allison is coming forward, um, this relates to us um, as a board wanting to meet the various people um, that serve um, in higher positions here in the city. And Allison's been with the city since 2010 when she was hired as a public information specialist. Um, before coming to the city, she worked as a marketing and communication consultant and directed special projects for the schools in Leon County. She's worked for the Tallahassee Chamber of Commerce and SunTrust Bank. She's a native of Tallahassee, attended FSU, and active with Leadership Tallahassee, Friends of the Library, Rotary, and the Junior League. So she's going to talk to us about what her office does, and she's been very helpful um, to me and to this board in getting various messages out for us. So Allison, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, board members, for the opportunity to come and give you a brief overview of the Department of Communications. So we exist to support the City Commission's vision of an open government where citizens are well informed and actually participate in the process. We share information about the city programs and services 
excuse me, services with residents in an engaging and meaningful, meaningful way. So a little bit about our department and its structure. We have full eight full-time employees, including myself. Um, we have three marketing and public information professionals. Um, two of which are accredited in public relations. We have three web developers and administrative support staff. So the office is set up and reports directly to the city manager. These are the four areas of focus that we concentrate on, um, media relations, community outreach, the support of our internal departments, and the online management of our social media and website. So a little bit about media relations. So we work to foster a relationship with our media representatives, both local, regional, and national media. In some instances, we've actually um, corresponded with media on an international level, which is exciting. We develop and distribute more than 250 news releases annually, um, all that are related to city program services and initiatives. And we also coordinate press conferences, media interviews, and we coordinate those interviews with um, content experts from various city departments. Community outreach. This is where we actually go out into the community. Um, we educate citizens and work to engage them in our city processes. Um, we use a variety of communication tools, everything from radio, um, video, direct mail, special events, community meetings. We even have been known to go door to door um, and talk with citizens one on one about significant events that we know that are gonna impact them the most. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we provide a lot of support services to our departments. Um, we provide public relations and marketing counseling. We also do media training. We do ad development. We do the creative, and we also do the ad placement. Everything from public notices to special events. We also provide writing and graphic design services. We manage um, our online presence. Hopefully you're all familiar with talgov.com. That's our primary source of um, information where we put things out. We get over 1.5 million visits annually to that website. And we also manage our social media presence. We have 35 social media channels across the city. COT News, which I hope you follow, um, is the primary, um, primary social media channel you can find that on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. And what we, as we see social media um, gain in popularity with citizens, um, we we're putting more resources <coughs> towards that because it provides a wonderful avenue for that engagement piece. Citizens can ask questions, they can comment, um, they can uh, start conversations with us, um, and we're able to communicate. So that two-way communication is vital. Again, our mission is to promote an open and transparent government, um, and we do that in a variety of ways that I mentioned earlier. So those are the highlights. A few examples of where we've gone out um, in the community. I'd, I'd love to mention the FAMU Way project that we've done. Hopefully you're familiar with that corridor. That's a multi-year project that we instituted every one of these um, avenues that I uh, mentioned earlier. We went door to door. We worked with residents. We worked with neighborhoods, the universities, and we engaged them in the process from the very beginning, the design process of the road, all the way through the grand opening. And we continue continue that dialogue as we continue to make improvements along that road, incorporating the history of the, of the area and highlighting it. Um, in addition, our department plays a key role in emergency management. Um, anytime that there's a weather-related issue or an emergency that's impacting the community, um, our staff is is very involved in that process and disseminating uh, information to citizens to keep them safe. So public safety is a, another a cornerstone of what we do. We work very closely with our fire department and our um, police department as well. That's it in a nutshell. I told you it was going to be brief. <laughs> yes. So uh, the website, for instance, for the senior center you all maintain. 
actually Parks and Rec um, in the Senior Center specifically, they maintain the content, so they provide us with that. And our web developers, um, actually, they put it into the system. We offer um, way usability features and things, ways that it can be, um, basically we take their content and we shape it in a way that we know that people want to see it. So I hope that answers your question. Part of it. Uh, the other question is something like COCA. Uh-huh. The art out here. Uh, do you have something to do with that also or not? We, COCA manages the art, but we do assist in the promotion of it. So we do provide assistance to them as well. Okay, that's interesting. And I just think, Allison, that um, our wonderful meetings are now included um, on the city's YouTube channel. Yes. So as you are surfing through the various um, videos of commission meetings and other city events, um, you can find our meetings. And so um, we've integrated into that, um, which I think actually gets us more hits. Yes, um, we are constantly looking at ways to increase accessibility to information. Um, this meeting is a great example. Um, we're always looking for, from, for feedback from citizens. We routinely survey them um, when we're out in the community, ask them how we can enhance that, but always evolving, always looking for new platforms and new ways to reach people and engage them. Okay. There are no other comments. Ms. Ferris, thank you. Uh, we had thank a chance you. to chat for a few minutes before the meeting, and uh, I would say um, it's a pleasure, like so many of the other people, for, well, all the people who've been here from the city to talk to us, uh, it's a pleasure to see people who love what they do and love this community, and, and that really came through in our conversation. So thank you I personally from me to you. Thank you for oh, what you do. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. The uh, next item on the agenda is any public comment on agenda items. We don't have any cards, so I'm seeing none. We'll move on. The uh, next would be a, a complaint process. Uh, we have two items. Uh, first, the city auditor, Mr. Fletcher, is going to uh, give us the nickel tour on the follow-up audit that was conducted on the... Um, city energy audit program, which we heard about three months ago, I believe? I believe so, yeah. Mr. Fletcher. Three or four months ago. I don't remember exactly when it was either. Uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, if you recall, the, the purpose of that initial audit was to determine if there was any conflict of interest uh, regarding certain energy auditors that had secondary employment in the uh, heating, venting, and air conditioning field, or HVAC field. Uh, we had four primary objectives in that first, in the initial audit. That was to determine whether any energy auditors that had secondary employment were using their city positions to inappropriately get business for themselves. Also to see if any, any, energy, aud any energy auditors were directing work to those other energy auditors with secondary employment or to specific contractors. Third was to determine if uh, those performing secondary empo employment were properly licensed. And then the fourth objective, I think, was to determine whether the uh, internal operating procedures were appropriate, or some of them. Uh, we conducted various procedures in the initial audit, the most important of which included uh, interviewing samples of city employees, I mean city utility customers, excuse me, that had energy audits performed for which the notes in the energy audit records indicated that they likely needed to have some air conditioning work done. Uh, we also reviewed the growth management permits that had been issued to the two energy auditors that we identified that did HVAC work as part of their secondary employment. Uh, we checked the licensure status of those two energy auditors, and we also uh, interviewed most of the energy audit staff as well as some of the key management staff in the, the energy office itself. Uh, we also reviewed the internal operating procedures. And in summary, in the initial audit, we found that there were no uh, what I term uh, actual conflicts of interest. And if, to put this in perspective, you've got to realize that I think on average they do over 6,000 energy audits a year. But we went back 10 years. By going back 10 years, we did find uh, six instances, I believe, in which uh, an energy auditor had, uh, had conducted an energy audit of a utility customer and then put in an air conditioning system at that place, either right before or right after he or she did the energy audit. Uh, 
and in, in those instances, we interviewed both the energy auditors that did that work and the, and the utility customers. And we interviewed them separately in, in, in independent interviews. They would not have had time to collude with each other. And they both said the exact same thing, which was, uh, I, I've only used this person my entire life for my air conditioning work, and that's the only person I'm, I'm going to use. Or uh, our children go to school together, play ball together, or whatever. So there were reasons for, for why it was done. But nonetheless, as we reported, at a minimum, that represents uh, to the average per person an appearance of a conflict of interest. Uh, and, and the city energy department, city management, recognized that. Uh, and in response to this audit, so we, we made several recommend recommendations. Uh, the city management energy office uh, uh, prepared a 10-step action plan. We followed up on that recently. And we found that each of those actions have been completed. Now, what were the actions taken? First, there were specific written procedures developed to provide that an energy auditor can no longer conduct secondary employment uh, for a city utility customer for which he or she has previously uh, done an energy audit. And vice versa, uh, they cannot do an energy audit at a location where they just where they put in a, a, a new air conditioning system, so they don't. There's not an appearance, or they're not evaluating their own work. Uh, third, each time that an energy auditor with secondary employment does work in connection with that uh, secondary employment for a city utility customer, they've got to report it to management, and it's got to be tracked in the utility record system for for energy audits. And we found there's been one such instance uh, since the initial audit, just one, and it was reported and is, and is being tracked in the system. Uh, we also found that the uh, written procedures of the office, uh, internal procedures, were revised to specifically state that, an energy, that the ener energy auditors cannot, uh, excuse me, can no longer name five or six contractors that might could do the work in the event that a customer asked them, uh, well, you say I need to have air conditioning work. Who, who can you recommend for me to do this work? The procedures used to say you could name five or six. You couldn't name one. They realized you couldn't name one. But even if you name five or six, you're given preference to those five or six over the other 40 or 50 in the city. So those procedures were, were revised such that and, and the auditor strains that they can no longer name anybody. So if a customer asks them, the most they can do is give them the comprehensive list of all of the contractors that participate in the various city energy office programs. And there's 50, 50 or 60 HVAC contractors on that, on that uh, list. Uh, another thing they did, another thing that was adopted, corrective action uh, or or practice that was implemented was that uh, contractors, uh, excuse me, energy auditors with secondary employment uh, cannot use the city records, they can't peruse the city records to see if there's customers out there that they might can call and get work in connection with their secondary employment. Notes are added in these fields that said, you know, air conditioner needs repair or servicing or whatever. So theoretically, they could go through those records and do it. Now, we found absolutely no instances of that in the initial audit. So we don't think that that did not occur, but still, we think that was a good thing to, to put in the internal procedures to specifically state that. And I think that also mirrors the state statute and overall city HR policy on, on uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, in addition, the energy auditors are now required to complete annual statements or assertions that provide, uh, excuse me, where for one first thing they do is they have to declare any secondary employment that they may perform for city utility customer. And secondly, they've got to assert whether or not they're aware of any conflicts of interest involving not only themselves, but other energy officers, uh, others in the city period as well. Uh, third, they've got to declare any financial or personal interest and any vendor or contractor that may get work resulting from a city energy audit. And they have to sign off, and they did, that they're aware of all these revised processes, 
processes and procedures that I mentioned earlier. And we found that, that each ener energy audit auditor has completed this uh, during our follow-up process. Uh, we also found that the one energy auditor that we reported that did not have a city uh, occupational business license <coughs> subsequently obtained that license, but if you've been listening to the uh, city commission and so forth, that license requirement has is, is been eliminated, not this coming year, but the year after next, whereas all businesses will no longer be required to, to uh, obtain a uh, occupational business license. Uh, as part of our follow-up, we, we, uh, we did pull a sample of, of energy audits uh, that had been conducted since the initial audit, for which there's some indication that HVAC work was needed. We called those customers to determine if there were any exceptions to the, to the revised procedures or, pro or processes. Uh, we also re-interviewed uh, a lot of the energy auditors themselves, as well as staff in the energy uh, office. And we reviewed all the growth management permits that, that have been issued since the original audit to those that we knew performed secondary uh, work in the HVAC field. And we found that there were no more exceptions to, to, uh, to these procedures, which is almost what we expected. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, recognize Ms. Meadows Key for her efforts in this matter. Uh, it, if it not been for her, this audit would not have been done and these improvements and, and recommendations would not have resulted. So thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Any comments, questions? Mr. Friedman. Yeah, I've got a slight question because I think maybe I didn't understand part of it. Uh, let's assume that an energy order uh, is sent to a house. I assume you call the city and they send someone out. Uh, the person does the audit and says, yeah, you need such and such. And the person then looks at the order and says, do you do that for a living? And he says, yes, I want you to do it. What happens? Well, if he did it, he'd, he'd be in big time violation of the state statute, the, the uh, city HR policies, and as well as these internal operating procedures. Mm -hmm. Good. No. All right. Absolutely. So, I mean, that, that's, that's fully covered. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. As always, pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to keep you after work. <laughs> um, and then related to that, um, we had a complaint uh, that Ms. Meadows Keefe is going to tell us about uh, very briefly. Um, it was 16-67. Uh, and, and the reason for this agenda item and the reason that we combined um, these two things is to demonstrate um, how our complaint process is performing. Um, we have in our bylaws um, our complaint procedures and um, specifically how when various complaints come in, they may be referred elsewhere or I may collaborate with someone on, on a resolution. So um, by having Mr. Fletcher come back, um, I wanted to demonstrate how um, the complaint came into my office. Um, I interviewed individuals. I, I, I could find nothing to substantiate those specific allegations. Um, I did ask Mr. Fletcher to assist, and this resulted in this kind of audit taking place. And now I, I think that this department has some good um, refinements in its policies and procedures. So I, I think that demonstrates that in that particular instance, um, that worked well. Um, the, the second complaint, the one that I, I did want to follow back up on, was from um, last month. And this was a call from a utility customer. Um, the utility customer had some complaints about um, her billing cycle and how that was being handled. Um, and apparently um, the billing cycle got extended so she could get additional time to pay. Um, some additional allegations were made about a particular employee. And I'm being sensitive um, because this is an employment matter. 
but um, I did contact the assistant city manager in charge of the utility program and basically just communicated to him, um, hey, I got this call. This is what this person alleged. Um, can you please check into it and report back? So um, in following back up, with that, um, I found out that the allegations made by the caller um, were indeed substantiated, and that employee um, was terminated from the position at the city. So again, in that situation, um, we have that if it's about an employee, it goes to management, and our role is to loop back and make sure that it's addressed, that it doesn't just kind of sit there. So I think this is another example of how that process works. Um, and the key is that there's cooperation, um, there's communication, and then um, it's the looping back to make sure that the action was taken. So, um, and, and I will say that every time I've had a situation like that, um, I've gotten excellent cooperation. Um, from people at every level, and they're very transparent about reporting back. So um, I wanted to just talk about that in terms of evaluating our complaint process. Okay, and I want to uh, warn the board members. One of the things I want to do um, somewhere around the end of the year before my, my term is up is I would like us to, to schedule some time to talk about the things that that we might recommend as improvements to the process. And one of the things I'd like for you to be thinking about is exact issues exactly like this, where we can refer them on to the city and let the city correct them internally and put in place those processes versus those things that ought to come before a board and the board ought to discuss that are, that are, are more eth you know, pure ethics matters and less uh, process violations. Um, there, there may or may not be changes we want to recommend. Some of them may be in terms of our own operating procedures. I think the end of the year would probably be a good time for us to reevaluate our, our own uh, processes and procedures. Uh, and others might be recommendations that we might want to make to the City Commission concerning anything from uh, what we see as, as general processes of the city to our jurisdiction to whatever. Um, but that, that would be a discussion for a couple months down the road. So fair warning, be thinking about it, because I'm going to be asking you for, your, for some hard thoughts. Um, with that item completed, uh, we are going to take a break until we'll come back at uh, um, five minutes till, I can't see the time, five minutes to five. Four, four fifty-five, we'll come back.
five. We are back. We're on item nine on the uh, agenda. It's the evaluation process, and we really have um, a number of things to talk about in terms of evaluations. Um, we have uh, staff. We have a contractor may ultimately have multiple contractors, and we have ourselves in terms of evaluations or the work of the board. So what I'd like to start with is um, Ms. Meadows Keefe's evaluation. The city, and you got copies of this, has a process uh, for performance reviews to complete them during the uh, city fiscal year, which ends on September 30th. Uh, and th they had a, a series of deadlines for evaluating the city employees. and. Um, First, I'd like to determine whether or not the board would like to, to kind of follow the city process in terms of annual evaluations on a, a fiscal year basis. It, it seemed to me that made some sense, but uh, it is not something we've talked about in the past. Mr. Frieden's nodding affirmatively. Yeah, I think it makes sense. It might as well do everything in tandem with the rest of the process. What other options? It's simpler. Well, we could, we could come up with, with any evaluation cycle we could do semi-annually, biannually, um, we could do it on a, a calendar year basis. Um, it, it seems to, that, now the city's process clearly is tied to then whatever the city does in terms of personnel action. So if they give bonuses or give raises, they want to tie that clearly to their, their fiscal year. Uh, because we're on the same fiscal year as them, we get our money from them. It makes some sense to me, again, uh, personally, for, for us to kind of stay in, in somewhat lockstep with them. So I'm seeing some, some either nodding or, or, certain, or, or lack of, of dissension there. So if we were to do that, we would need to have to complete our evaluation in, uh, by the end of September. So we have next meeting. So that would take us to the second issue of, <clears throat> well, first let me, let me finish. Um, uh, this, we're talking about uh, Ms. Meadows Keefe, eva Keefe's evaluation, and I'll come back to, to other people in a minute, but you, you got two different forms. Uh, one says uh, City of Tallahassee, FY 2016 Performance Management Document Supervisor Manager that is 11 pages long. Mm -hmm. And then you got one that's four pages that says Appointed Official Performance Evaluation Form, which is uh, far shorter. It's basically, I'm sorry, it's not even four pages. It's uh, two pages, not four pages. Uh, one page for the evaluation and then a page of uh, instructions. So the question would be, um, which of these we would use? One, the, the longer form goes into great detail, teamwork, customer service, leadership, uh, with some of these broken into, into subtopics, communication skills, interpersonal skills, uh, employee excellence, educational knowledge, adaptability, administrative systems and process, delegating, decision planning, and you know, several dozen items. The shorter form, uh, would require us to evaluate Ms. Meadows Keefe on six items, customer service, uh, support, not for the city commission, but for this board, uh, leadership, general management, employee management, and financial management. Um, do people have, do the board members have a uh, uh, preference as to whether we use the long form or the short form? I do. Mr. Freed. I, I, I think the short form basically covers everything that needs to be covered. Uh, frankly, the, the long form to me looks like it was designed by about six or eight different committees, everybody putting in something to make sure they had everything humanly possible. There's nothing that's in the long form that can't be mentioned if needed or wanted in the short form, in okay. my opinion. I'm, I'm seeing general consensus on the short form. I'm not going to do this by motions because this is just a kind of an internal discussion we'll have next time. So what we will do is um, I'll work with Ms. Meadows Keefe we'll, to modify the short form uh, so we get re rid of references to city commission and put in the ethics board. Uh, what I would, the process I would propose, if this is okay with you, is um, well before the meeting we'll send you a blank copy of the modified short form along with the instructions. You fill it out, keep a copy, which you will bring to the meeting, and send in a copy 
um, and you can put it in a sealed envelope if you want. It's not like Ms. Meadows Keefe is going to do anything with it, but she will give it to me at the beginning. She will give them the set of them to me at the beginning of the meeting. And then I, what I would propose to do is I'll, I'll have six pieces of paper in front of me, and if, like for instance, the first one is customer service. If everybody says she scores a four, all six of, of us, and of course Ms. Phillips will be back, so we'll include her. Everybody says she, she serves a four and nobody has any additional comments, then I'll just announce that and we'll move on so that we can use our time expeditiously. But, and then we can discuss where, Pete, where there's a difference in the scoring, which I, and I expect there will be some, or where there's a difference, in, or where there's somebody has a comment, either particularly positive or, or something that, that needs improvement. Uh, we'll discuss those and we'll reach consensus as a board and, and we can complete that, evalu her evaluation next month. Now, I'm getting, I'm getting consensus. My next question for you is, um, I don't know what the city is doing for their employees next year, if anything. I think it's been city practice to try to give small annual raises. Do we want to do what, whatever it is the city is going to do? Do we just want to follow suit? What If, if they're doing uh, raises, bonuses, whatever they do, that we would do the same thing based on the outcome of the evaluation, or do we want to uh, forge our own path? May I ask a question? At her Mr. Level, Friedman. Uh, do we know what the raises look like for the uh, Ms. Meadows Keefe says she does. I think that based on what I understand, there's a plan for a 2% um, employee raise based upon a satisfactory evaluation. Am I getting, do I get a nod from back there? I am getting a nod from back there. Hopefully we're not announcing something employees don't know. <laughs> no, this has been discussed in public. Okay. Okay. Question. So it looks like two percent. If someone scores better than satisfactory, I assume what, what's the highest level? Uh, the highest score and is um, outstanding. Okay. Yeah, if someone scores an outstanding, uh, it would occur to me that maybe they ought to get a bigger raise, and someone just gets a satisfactory. At least that's my take on the thing. Okay. Well, let the man. The Mr. question Stein. is um, regarding if there's across the board raises ATB or if it's merit um, increases. So I think most um, institutions, including public institutions, are really moving away from just ATBs. Um, everything's merit-based now. So I do concur with the idea that it should be attached to performance and if she meets a certain level, it could be outstanding, it could be uh, meet satisfactory, meets expectation. Um, there could be a certain overall, if you want to do it by number rather than uh, a lack of numeric score, rather than you know, the, the place where she falls, then we could say that and say you need to get at least a 3.5 to merit an increase. Or otherwise, so th that decision is up to us. But I, I'm much more comfortable with a performance-based um, increase. Okay. Again, I'm seeing nods. So let's leave that until next meeting. We know that what, where the city is. We know we have. I believe we have authority to do whatever we would choose to do. Uh, so I, I think it would be appropriate to do the evaluation first, and then decide what we want to do uh, with the, the city's uh, plan. Uh, in place. Um, the the next thing is uh, Ms. Atkins uh, sitting over here. Um, uh, it would be my recommendation that Ms. Meadows Keefe does her evaluation since she works with her the most directly. Great Mr. question. Uh, the evaluations that I'm familiar with, obviously the federal sector, mm -hmm. are done by the supervisor and then generally countersigned by the person above. That would be you for our employee and I guess the entire board for Ms. Meadows Keefe, is that right? Uh, we we can do it that way. We're we're uh, deciding how we're going to handle it. That that I, I think that that would be if that works for people, that would be fine. Hey, you, you have a rating official and a reviewing official. That way, you've got two people looking at it. Okay. Like um. So so uh, Ms. Meadows Keefe will be the rating official, and I'll be the reviewing official. So I just got a new duty, lucky me. Okay. Um. What I would like to do then, at, and and you have also. Uh, in your packet, uh, a copy of Miss Meadows Keefe's. Uh, uh, where is it? Challenge. 
job description. Job description. I've, I've misplaced mine already. Um, but you, you might want to take a look at that and as, uh, be aware of what's in there. At the next meeting, I, I'm going to put on the agenda um, any thoughts or suggestions or changes to that job description. Since we've now had a good year and a half, we may have ideas about things that we would like to change in the job description. And I'm not suggesting that we're opening up her position, but um, certainly for her, if, if there's something that we, we haven't been doing as a board that we think is important or that she hasn't been doing as, as our uh, executive director that we think is important, we can add that and she can either gain that skill set or at, in, in the future at some point when after she's long retired and we have a, another person will know that we that that's important to us so it would be a good opportunity for us to review that also on next month's agenda I'm going to uh, since Mr. Currington will be back I, I would like to suggest if the board concurs that we ought to for any uh, contract employees who are, are longer term contracts not somebody who comes in to do a you know a one shot investigation for us that we ought to do evaluations of them also he's not an employee but he it, it, it sure feels like he is when we're sitting in these meetings so kind of a performance evaluation contract review so we'll send you copies of his contract we won't I don't know that I want to use particularly a, a a form for that, but just have a, a general discussion uh, to see if, if there are things where we would like uh, to see our uh, attorney do something more or less different. Do we get a report of his billables? The hours he's working every um, Sure. We, we, we can include that uh, as part of the, uh, the ethics officer report. It's, it's on the, um, uh, the spending sheet. It, it's on there, but it's it's not it's not broken out. No, not on that sheet. It's not. But that would be a good thing for us to add. And I, I that that would mm -hmm. be perfect. Uh, the, the kind of thing I was expecting to do next month, and we'll do it this month. We'll just add that as something that you see on a regular basis. Um, both he and we have been have tried to keep his his hours uh, down, and he he's even said several times, you know, I this I did enough research to answer the question I didn't do you know every bit of research you could do because we probably have not needed that on most of the questions so we will add that'll be on next month's agenda f some something for you to be thinking about and also I would like not necessarily for us to do it next month but for us to think about it, it would be my proposal that we ought to do an annual or biannual I don't know which semi-annual every two year <laughs> evaluation of the board itself um, and that, that's what I, I'm kind of proposing that we do by the end of the year where we look at how we operate everything from our internal operations to our authority uh, and our relationship with the city to, to see where we can make changes or we can recommend changes so be thinking of that as, as really part of an evaluation process and I would think that would probably be uh, November December that we'd be talking about that in some more detail Mr. Friedman would that be like a state of the board report or something it, it, it you know, might be in the, it might be in the nature of a report of kind of an annual uh, a, a summary just in a couple of pages mm -hmm. uh, but, but also our thoughts, if, if there are times that you've walked out of, whether it's a shade meeting or one of our uh, public meetings, and you've walked out and been a little uncomfortable, you felt like you would have liked to have had more information, you felt like uh, the discussion got too far afield, um, you thought that the, the, the chair was being just, you know, too wacky at the moment and, and ought to control himself or herself. It's your wife's um, yeah, just several people have claimed, complained that it's their problem. Um, then, then we we can we can uh, put all of that down. Some of it, it, you know, may be formal, and some of it may just be advice to ourselves in terms of how we we uh, can do a better job. But I I think that's something that, that we need to do since we're still new. Um, I, I think we've got uh, our feet under us, and we've got our policies and pretty much in place. But. Um, if, if we're going to review Ms. Meadows Keefe, we probably ought to take a look at our own work too, mm -hmm. since there's nobody nobody to review us other than the citizens mm -hmm. if they put something else on the ballot, I guess. Ms. Meadows Keefe. Another thing that I would recommend, and I've done a fair amount of reading on this topic, that as the board moves forward, that, um, you know, we've got our really good mission statement um, to be a preventative board um, and to instill confidence in government in our citizens but 
maybe to go a step further and start thinking of some action steps, and, and this ties into what the chair was saying, um, if we want to accomplish this mission, um, put legs to it. How are we going to do it, and how are we going to measure the effectiveness of the board? And you could argue on one hand, well, you don't get a whole lot of complaints. Um, well, that could be because the board's doing its job and people aren't messing up. Or you could say, well, we're not communicating well enough about our hotline number, so we're not getting the complaints. So, I mean, it's things like that that I think the community is going to say, um, how are you measuring your success and how have you made a difference in how citizens feel? And, and so I think looking at that will be important, especially as we talk about budget and that taxpayer dollars are being expended. Um, how is the board going to um, take action each year to move forward on that mission and maybe come up with a vision statement and some action statements um, for itself? So that's just kind of a vision for the future, so that if you look down the road a year, what would you like this board to be doing? And as the community might hear this um, on the video, um, the public would be welcome with those sorts of comments as well, because um, they voted for this board. Um, they have a stake in it. So as the board moves forward, what would the public like? So to receive those comments too. Right, particularly on our self-evaluation, I think I'm, I'm hoping we will get some some public comment either by email or by testimony in a in a meeting. Yeah. And I, I would pro I would my plan at this point is to stretch that across two meetings so we give people an opportunity to kind of see where we think we're going and and respond not only to what we've done but to what we're saying about where we're headed. Um, May I ask a question, Mr. Friedman? In your opinion, as chair. And also, uh, Ms. Meadows Keith, you too, please. Are there, what things do we need to do that we have not yet fully uh, set up? I mean, I know one, for instance, is we haven't put any investigate. We haven't put the stuff out for investigators. And we haven't put anybody on retainer, or at least put them on notice that they're they'll do an investigation if we need one. But are there any other things anybody can think of? that we ought to have that we don't have right now? I mean, I think that, that should come up. Mr. Ojtayo. I asked this at the last meeting. I asked this last meeting as well. Um, our ethics statute, um, we need to build that out. That's urgent. That's on the list. Yeah, that, that, that would be a recommendation that would go beyond our immediate powers, but um, um, I, I think there are several people who... who but we're tasked ideas. with... Making those recommendations. Making those recommendations, right? Well, I, I certainly think it's within our authority to recommend something to the, the city council. No, I mean, the charter says we're supposed to put it together and then... Yeah. Uh, the, so the city commission is the one that enacts it. Um, I thought it said somewhere we're supposed to develop, yeah, there you go, assist in the development of the ethics code. Mm -hmm. right. um, so and so far as I, I doubt that the city commissioner is um, necessarily engaged with developing it and they might defer to us in this regard, so we should probably. Just yes. putting that, that out there. That, Mr. That, chair, would, that would be part of the discussion. Ms. Meadows Keefe. I think in talking with the chair about the next few months, um, w one process I have in my head is that we would actually go through the ethics code, the state ethics code, and, and look at um, what it says and say on gifts. Um, there's a limit on gifts of $100. Do we, are we satisfied with that, or would we like less amount? Um, for gifts. So you would look at the ethics code, and again, as you all know, that's the floor. Um, so do we want to make um, do we want to make more stringent requirements? So I think that'd be one exercise to go through as a board to see where we think the ethics code is lacking and what standards we might want to recommend for improvement. So that is on the list of things to accomplish before the end of the year. And any thoughts that board members have about 
things they'd like to see included or recommended, you can offer those to me at any time um, for this meeting that'll occur before the end of the year. I, I would add two things to that. I think there are some other local governments that have put in place a variety of, of ethics code uh, provisions, and we may want to cherry pick among those in terms of our thoughts and recommendations. And then I think it would also be very valuable to us to look at the State Ethics Commission. They do an annual report. Um, and you can look at that to see where uh, they are finding problems, uh, what, what topics are particular problems for them, what topics are, are particular hotspots in terms of people asking for opinions. Um, and it may be that, that um, we look at that to find the one, that we don't need everything, but that we find that there are two or three key things that really seem to, to cover 80% of the waterfront. And, and uh, we, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to ask the city commission to, for a book if we go down that path. It would be nice if we could give them something that's simple and clean and straightforward uh, that, for them to consider, if, if that's what we choose to do. Can Mr. We, Urge Tile. Can we also consider putting something of that nature together for the city, an ethics report on the city? Um, just to, because w one of the, I guess, impetus behind this charter amendment and behind this board was concerns about the state of ethics in the city. Um, if we issue an annual report about, you know, ethics in the city and its operations, um, of course, including the work that we're doing as a board, I think that will go towards transparency and showing the city whether confirming or, or discounting, I guess, the fears or what have you about what is the nature of the the ethical nature of our city and its operations that's that's great material that's exactly the kind of thing that i want to get in our self-evaluation recommendation process and again I'd, I, my plan would be to devote substantial time over two meetings to, to exactly that discussion mr friedman if we do that it would be very interesting to see if it's possible feasible to slip some sort of uh, uh, shortened form of that into the city utility bills and literally get one delivered to virtually everyone in the city. I think something like that might be very, very worthwhile. You're talking about getting the word out. That's a way to get the word out. If everybody gets one a utility bill, they're, they're going to look at it because people actually read bills. I think, and I, I don't know if Mr. Shelley's leaving the room or if he's coming forward to make a comment. He's leaving the room. Um, <laughs> I, I'll have to verify this, but I, I do know that there are specific pr processes one must go through to have things included in a utility bill. And I think the last time I thought of this for some other purpose, I was told that it needs to relate to utilities um, in order to be included in the utility bill. So energy savings, that kind of thing. But I can check on that um, to make sure. I'll also say two things that I, last year I did make a report to the city commission um, because it was part of my job responsibilities, I think before I was hired by this board. So I did make kind of a basic report to the city commission in written form and it was adopted or accepted at one of their meetings. Um, the city commission also has as a priority this year um, hearing from every board. Now, I know we're not an advisory board, we're not like any other board, but they are asking on an annual basis that each of these entities come to a meeting and briefly report on their activities to the full commission. So I think it would be helpful um, for this board and to the commission for us to get on a schedule to do that so that a report, if we make one, can be presented to them and then the chair or whoever wants to come at the time draws the short straw can come and um, talk to the commission and address any questions. So they've identified that. They want to kind of know what all these different boards are doing. Okay, so it sounds, it sounds like there are a number of things that are all kind of aiming at the same bullseye on the same target. Uh, so hope, hopefully we, by the end of the year we can uh, assemble all of that into a package of, of uh, items, action items that the board is comfortable with. 
So again, uh, something to begin thinking about, giving you plenty of notice. Uh, the next item on the agenda, item 10, is uh, bylaws, a change in bylaws. This is on complaint procedures, I believe. Ms. Meadows Keefe. Yes, Mr. Chair, and I, I need to share that um, this is a result of um, your committee of one idea that Mr. Davis and I worked on. And one of the things we talked about was a, a establishing a, a probable cause committee. And you, as the chair, have the authority to um, set up um, committees. So um, if we got a complaint that was urgent and needed fast determination before a, a meeting, monthly meeting was scheduled, um, there could be a panel designated to determine legal sufficiency or probable cause. So this just adds a sentence um, that the committees may include probable cause committees. I need to say publicly, because I neglected to uh, communicate this to the chair, that um, our council um, said that you may want to consider whether you would want a probable cause um, committee to just be a committee of one. So he suggested committees may include probable cause committees not to exceed two board members, because you wouldn't want more than two, because then you'd have a limit on who can actually um, hear and decide the case. So um, Mr. Currington suggested we change that language to not to exceed at least two board members. Okay, I, I had a, a similar thought. I'm, I'm concerned when we have a probable cause panel that those members would, would then be excluded from future deliberations. And uh, it, it seems to me reasonable for the, the chair to make kind of an initial call that if the, it, it looks like the probable cause decision is going to be difficult, uh, maybe put, throwing a couple people at it's fine, but if it's going to be simple and cut and dry that, that uh, using one person so that you then have the five remaining people for the adjudicatory stage. Uh, Case by case. Yes, case it would be case by case in the in the, the eyes of the view of the chair, whether it's one person or two two persons. And okay, so that that would come back for a final vote at the next meeting. If With that okay. language, that's that that short uh, item that you had. That's only three lines long. Um, next item on the agenda is public comment on non-agenda items. Seeing none. Uh, I had uh, mentioned at the last meeting that I would be happy to put on the agenda. I'm going to do this at every meeting, ask if there's anything that any board member wants to appear on the next agenda. You all have given us several good ideas uh, for our the, the agendas that will cover our self-evaluation uh, process. Is there anything else that you want to make sure that we have a public discussion on? Seeing nothing, uh, I will announce our next meeting is Tuesday, September 20th, 2016 from four to seven, sit in this uh, same location. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>